fire is so extreme, so intense that it's actually changing the weather. We begin at five o'clock with the ever growing and raging bootleg fire in southern Oregon. Now at 241,000 acres in spots, firefighters are even being forced to retreat from the battle. And this fire isn't just bringing flames, but lightning too, as it's grown so powerful, it's creating its own weather. Maggie Vespa has the latest. As America's largest wildfire rages, all the crews and equipment, they're pulling off the line. Firefighters overnight retreat. The north flank of the bootleg fire blew up. Portions of the front lines are just too dangerous. Infrared video shows the power of the bootleg fire burning in southern Oregon, northeast of Klamath Falls. It grew again overnight. As of Friday, it's at more than 241,000 acres with 7% contained. It's already burned 75 buildings, many of them homes. Now, bootleg is exhibiting extreme fire behavior. What does that mean? Oregon uh, Department of Forestry spokesman Marcus fire Kaufman. Fire. Extreme fire behavior is a, like a, a combination of circumstances that you just don't see every day. Things like crowning, when the fire consumes a whole tree and gets up into the crown of the tree. Another extreme sign, this pyrocumulus cloud created by the bootleg fire. The fire is so extreme, so intense that it's actually changing the weather. It's changing the direction of the winds. It's creating its own clouds. It's creating lightning. Lightning is the last thing uh, evacuees so want to right hear line. about. The trees were exploding. There's little tornado, fire tornadoes going up. Thursday, and Tim so, McCarley uh, told us the fire had destroyed most of his family's possessions packed in trailers. His house near Bly, which was under construction, survived. Friday, Red Cross volunteers so, uh, say the McCarleys and other right. families have now been allowed to return home and literally sift through the ashes. So these are the what the sifters look like. It's just a box that has uh, chicken wire attached to it so they can sit, literally sift through the ashes to find if they can find jewelry or if they can find keys. Despite the devastation, evacuation orders lifting in some areas is a sign of progress and more crews are arriving from out of state to help. The state fire marshal tweeting photos of reinforcements from Washington and California. They'll battle brutally dry conditions fueled by record drought and last month's historic heat wave, which killed more than 100 Oregonians. Obviously, the West is the canary in the coal mine in terms of climate. Governor and Kate Brown on MSNBC Thursday. Climate change is happening. Our people are dying. We must take action and politics cannot get in the way. So Marcus Kaufman, who you saw in that piece, noted what's so bizarre about this fire's extreme behavior is that it's been exhibiting that behavior for days on end. And that's something that crews really haven't seen before with past fires. So day after day, it's just exhausting them. And that's why we were so glad to see this tweet today from AccuWeather. Proby, the therapy dog, traveled to southern Oregon to keep firefighters' spirits up amid this grueling fight. Dan. Yeah, they'll certainly need it. Thank you, Maggie. Let's bring in meteorologist Joe Ranieri right now for an explanation of where the weather has been and how it has been uh, dealing with this fire, Joe. Yeah, hey there, Dan. Well, hey, as we look at the radar, all is pretty quiet along the coast of the valley, but let's, let's go down to southern Oregon. This isn't clouds that's forming. This is from the fire that the radar is picking up. And so far, we haven't seen any lightning strikes, but you just heard from Maggie's bees. Uh, this fire is burning so intense and just so massive that it's creating its own weather pattern. Over the last couple of days, we've been talking about pyrocumulus clouds. We'll get to that in a second, but I want to bring in the visible satellite imagery. You can kind of see right here. It's just massive out in southern Oregon. It's going to continue to burn over the next couple of, you know, I should say a couple days, several weeks before crews can get a really handle on it. So what are these pyrocumulus clouds? Well, they're essentially fire clouds. They form much like a thor thunderstorm does as the sun heats the smoke late in the afternoon. And well, it heats the ground as well. And some of these uh, can actually form uh, what's called uh, fire tornadoes. We haven't seen evidence of that, but it's not out of the realm of possibility to see that happen over the next couple of days. As we look at the smoke forecast, we'll put this in motion. If you're west of the mountains, you're not going to have any issues with the smoke and haze this weekend, but you are definitely going to be seeing it and smelling it if you're just going to be maybe doing some camping throughout the high desert. That includes Bend and Redmond and throughout the central and eastern side of the state. And that smoke is it can continue just to sit over much of eastern Oregon over the next couple of days and in the early part of next week. And as you can see, on this model, as we zoom out a little bit, that smoke that's uh, starting to billow throughout southern 
southern Oregon is starting to fill the sky throughout just not only eastern Oregon, but western Idaho, parts of Washington and Montana. Back to you guys. Thank you, Joe. And one of the newest fires in our region is burning in Wallowa County in northeast Oregon. The Elbow Creek fire broke out yesterday and it's burned 9,000 acres. It's causing evacuations for people living in the communities of Eden Bench and Troy. More firefighters are heading to the area today to help out. There are other fires burning too, and we have the latest details for you on KGW.com. Just text the word wildfires to the number on your screen. 503-226-5088 and we'll text you back with a direct link. Coming up tonight on the story at six o'clock, a major development surrounding Portland police accountability and new action from the federal government. Kyle Aboshi joins us in the newsroom now with a preview. Kyle. Well, the U.S. Department of Justice is pushing Portland police to get body cams. It's one of several changes that Department of Justice lawyers want the city to make in order to satisfy a 2014 settlement agreement over police reform. A KGW investigation earlier this year found of the top 75 big city police departments, Portland is the only agency that doesn't have body worn cameras. Last night, a civil rights attorney from the Department of Justice spoke with a community group and explained the value of body cams illustrated by the June 24 shooting of Michael Ray Townsend at a North Portland motel. Portland police didn't have body worn cameras, but surveillance footage captured the deadly shooting and helped show the public, police and the Department of Justice exactly what happened. But for the fortuitous nature of there having been a surveillance camera there, would we really know what happened with any sort of insurance? We would have different versions of events, but on the recording, you have solid data on which to rely. The city of Portland has explored police body cams for nearly a decade, but those efforts have been stymied by a lack of money and politics. Although now one of the most outspoken critics, Commissioner Joanne Hardesty, has changed her tone. We'll explain coming up in about an hour on the story. Thank you, Kyle. Survivors of violence in Multnomah County are getting some extra help. Gavlin Etlin looks at how the need is growing and why the county wants more people to know how to get help. Kate is a local survivor of domestic violence. I didn't feel like I deserved anything better than that. She was with her abuser for two years. What sort of violence were you subjected to? I had been put in the, admitted to the hospital on three different occasions um, with a broken nose, um, busted eardrum. Her situation reached a breaking point at the start of the pandemic. There was nothing available because of COVID. So many people aren't aware that there is help available. Erica Pruitt is director of Multnomah County's Department of Community Justice. Last year, its Victim and Survivor Services Unit helped about 500 people impacted by some kind of violence. She says that need is growing. And this is particularly true right now as it pertains to gun violence. The program is receiving an extra $93,000 through the American Rescue Plan. That money will boost the notification system for survivors so they know the status of their aggressor through the courts. Why is it so important now to have this? We're seeing people being isolated coming out of a pandemic and needing support and needing connection. Separate funding also helps survivors and their families back on their feet through food and rent assistance and referrals to other wellness services. Finally, I had enough. Kate escaped her abuser and got help through the county. Her message to others now. There is hope. Just reach out. Keep reaching out. Don't give up. Hold on to the light. Galen Etlin, KGW News. Washington has revealed the winner of the $1 million grand prize in its shot of a lifetime COVID vaccine lottery. The lucky recipient is Cameron M of South King County in the Seattle area. Governor Inslee presented him with a check in Olympia today. I want to say that you know, I've never given a million dollar check to someone. This is a new experience in my life. And I'm not quitting my job. I'm staying because <laughs> I, you know, I got to keep bringing that income coming in. <laughs> a million dollars doesn't go as far as it used to. Cameron works as a motorcycle mechanic and is in his early 20s. He says he plans to put the money toward a house and investments. Good for him. 